What's up? Welcome into another episode of Pod Like a Champion, the Blue and Gold.com recruiting podcast. It's Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. Cinco de Mayo. I'm Patrick Engel, joined as always by our recruiting insider at Blue and Gold.com, Mike Singer. So, Mike, another commitment in the in the bag for Notre Dame. Uh for for it seems like it almost felt like it had been ages between there, but no, not really. And just because this was, you know, one that I think had been not inevitable, but Notre Dame had been in a, a good spot for it from the minute it offered. Uh, maybe it doesn't, you know, ring the, oh, my God, this is huge. But I don't know. I think Eli Reardon is a nice pickup for him. It, it has a, a chance to be, a, uh, you know, a legitimate impact player here. And, and we'll dive into all this later. But, yes, news of uh, – since we last recorded, biggest news in the world of recruiting, Eli Reardon, three-star tight end out of Iowa, committed to Notre Dame. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've already had some, you know, folks at Rivals, you know, ask me, like, hey, do you think this guy is a four-star? Like, Mike, you know him better than than us right now. So, um, you know, m- my thoughts is that I- I'm usually a little bit more on the conservative side when it comes to ranking. So, Reardon is a 5.7, which is a high three-star designation. Why it's the scales on a five? I-, I don't know, but that's besides the point. I... I could certainly see him. Like, I, I think he'll end up a four-star guy. I might want to see his early senior season film before I decide: is he a five-point-eight four-star? Is he a five-point-nine? Like, I, I would. I, so I would be like, let, let's let's wait on, on the ranking. Like, we don't need to bump him right now. Let's see um, what he is. You know, uh, to start his senior season. This thing's not a sprint; it's a race. But in terms of the commitment. Um, of course, go to blueandgold.com um, for all the coverage on Raritan. Uh, also, had a YouTube video where, where we d- talked about the news um, as it broke. Um, really nice player. Um, I think he's going to be an, an NFL player, second, third round kind of guy. Continue that Notre Dame tight end U tradition. I really don't think tight end U is Iowa. I, I think it's Notre Dame, and that's not me saying that as the Notre Dame guy. Um, that's just me saying it as a, a college football fan. Um, you know, when we got to see him in person a couple weeks ago and he's by our office in South Bend, really big frame, really long arms. His dad, Scott Raritan Jr., of course, played at Notre Dame in the early 2000s. Um, he's a big dude as well. Um, on the field, Raritan does it all. Um, like he's a, um, a solid blocker um, as, as a tight end. Um, you know, he, he, again, he's got that big wingspan. So, um, you know, he can catch the ball very well, um, go over defenders. Um, again, like he's just a well-rounded, um, tight end. Like, um, I, 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 there's not really weaknesses in, in his game at this point. He's got the length. He's got the size. He runs well. He catches well. Very athletic when you see him on the basketball court. So all in all, I uh, like this get for Notre Dame, Patrick. Yeah, we'll dive into you know how it came together and and kind of where Notre Dame goes next here at tight end and, and on offense. First, want to make sure you guys are following us on Twitter. Follow Mike at Rivals underscore Singer. You can follow me at Patrick Engel underscore. That's E N G E L. Also, want to make sure you guys are subscribed to our YouTube channel. If you're listening on podcasts, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you'd be so kind, please leave us a rating, leave us a review. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. All of it helps us reach more people. That's all we want to do. Hope you guys uh, enjoy it. If you would be so kind uh, to to help us out in that regard. And also want to make sure uh, you guys know how to uh, donate to the Loose Emoji a memorial scholarship. You can go to blueandgold.com and you'll see it at the top of the site there. It's a link with instructions for uh, a way to make a contribution to that if that's something uh, you are interested in doing. So, Mike, Raritan offered in February, committed in, uh, I guess it was early May, uh, May 2nd. So uh, three days before we're recording this on uh, May 5th. Feels like, again, when they offered, kind of caught your eye of, yeah, you think Notre Dame is going to be a a player here given – his dad played for Notre Dame. His grandfather was a former strength coach here. There's a lot of familiarity. He's a tight end. Uh, Notre Dame's tight end trajectory uh, and track record, I should say, uh, is appealing uh, for, for tight end recruits. But I don't know. T- take me through how this came together or 
are kind of the notable things that really made Reardon end up here and in, in how it happened. Yeah, it was not that difficult to kind of figure out. Like he got his offer on, um, I believe it was like February 9th. I put in a future cast two days later. I was like, look, I'm here in Notre Dame once this kid. So if they want him, like it's hard for me to see a young man whose um, father played at Notre Dame and then uh, in before his father, his grandfather was a uh, uh, strength and conditioning coach at Notre Dame. Like, come on, like that just it makes too much sense. And he's a tight end like Bobby Taylor Jr. Like Notre Dame didn't have a chance there as a defensive back, like but a tight end like uh, that one made a lot of sense. Um, so Notre Dame's uh, Tommy Reese, John McNulty did a nice job in the recruitment. Uh, Brian Kelly got involved. Um, I thought he was going to pop really early, like soon after he got that Notre Dame offer. Um, it, it did take a little bit longer than I had expected, um, mainly because he was just focused on his um, – junior basketball season um so once that ended he really shifted to recruiting took self-guided tours to iowa and iowa state and then that notre dame won the weekend of april 24th i believe it was uh just kind of sealed the deal and i and i felt like he had official visits set up to iowa iowa state notre dame and tennessee but i felt like after that notre dame self-guided tour he was gonna be like what am i like what am i waiting for like Am I really going to end up at Iowa or Iowa State or Tennessee, you know, after their whole McDonald's bag thing? So, um, you know, that self-guided tour of Notre Dame, even though he couldn't see the coaching staff um, because of the dead period, um, you know, he decided to go ahead and lock in with Notre Dame. So we think he's going to be one of two tight ends in the class. If one, we go off of Mike, another future cast you have in, and two, just because that's player they've been recruiting for a while and that's holding stays not committed yet obviously but uh, we've talked about him a ton you've liked where notre dame stands for quite some time notre dame once i don't know i would say like once a second tight end regardless but it once holding stays as that second tight end where do you like what's i think it seems like we talk about him every podcast but tell the people the latest there what do they got to know is this still progressing and headed toward what your future cast indicates you think it is headed toward. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So yeah, it's interesting when Notre Dame offered rare and it offered, um, then it offered stays the next day. Um, and it's like, all right, you have Jack nickel committed. You're offering two. Is it like one, whoever's first, like first dibs for that second tight end spot? Cause the plan all along was not to take a second tight end. Like that kind of just, um, you know, happened in, in a way that they, they moved to deciding that's what they wanted to do. So they go after stays hard. Um, and uh, he had decommitted from Penn State on February 5th. Um, and Le Texas, LSU, I think even Alabama a little bit have been in the mix since he, um, you know, decommitted from Penn State. But I think this one's all Notre Dame. Uh, Jack Nickel decommitted um last month so that opened the door for notre dame to land both stays and raritan and uh i think that's what's going to end up happening um stays is um going to officially visit um notre dame in june and uh i, I you know what his recruitment looks like as far as the timeline you know we'll kind of have to see does he pop sooner than june does he wait until his official visit you know we'll just kind of see but uh feel really confident in my future cast pick for um for notre dame but uh patrick i'm curious to get your thoughts so notre dame has rared and committed um holden stays let's just assume that he is in this class and then you have kane barong and, and mitchell evans in the 2021 class and it's funny mitchell evans like a lot of people thought he was going to be a tackle but and seeing those clips that Notre Dame sends to the media and seeing him in the spring game, catching three passes for 59 yards, looks really good. 2020 class, Michael Mayer and Kevin Baum. So that's three straight classes of two tight ends. Well, what are your kind of your thoughts right now about the tight end room, the numbers? I mean, because Michael Mayer is going to be a three and out guy. Tommy Tremble left. Cole Komet left the, the prior year. Um, so, like, what do you kind of think about the tight end room right now? 
I don't see how it's anything other than at minimum satisfactory. I mean, you have Michael Mayer in there, right? But obviously he's not going to be around forever. And you're probably looking at 2022 as uh, what feels like the last season he's going to play for Notre Dame before heading out after three years. But yeah, I think in the little parts you saw in the spring game of Mitchell Evans and Kane Barong, you see some, you know, exciting starter kits there of, all right, baseline ability to be a, a good tight end and, and traits that, you know, you want in, in good tight ends that translate to high level play at that position. Uh, from Mike, you've paid attention to Reardon and, and stays more than I have, but it sounds like you think that's the case with, with them as well. And yeah, we just saw this year yet again, the continued streak of every tight end who's started for Notre Dame on opening day has turned into a draft pick. Michael Mayer, that is obviously going to be extended with him. I think when you look behind him, there are guys who have starter kits and, and tight end traits that you think could lead someone in that group or at least someone into a point where they end up you know, contributing to that streak of, of Notre Dame tight ends getting their shot uh, as, a, as a draft pick. Yeah, I, I'm – uh, I'm maybe a little bit biased because I love Kane Barong and like uh, I love that family and you know spent a lot of time covering him while he was a high school recruit. But you know I think the world of Kane Barong and I've heard good things from sources in South Bend about um, you know what he has shown in, in spring practices. Um, Mitchell Evans I think has been uh, one of the bigger surprises of fall camp with like that dude. I'm not ruling out that he could still move to tight end or excuse me, offensive tackle, but he looked really good um, this, uh, this spring. And you, you got to remember he was playing uh, quarterback as a senior. And uh, you know, so, so he, he didn't play, um, you know, the last time he had really played tight end was his junior season um, in 2019. Um, so I think he's just a big old athlete who's um, again, impressed the, the, the Notre Dame coaching staff. You know, Kevin Bauman, George Takis, interesting players. Um, T- Bauman was injured near the end of spring ball. Takis, Brian Kelly praised a good bit. So, um, seems like post Tommy Tremble. And, of course, you have Michael Mayer, right? But, like, we're just kind of, like, you know what you have there. He's a stud. Like, what's behind him? You know, tight end, you looking good. And then even the 2023 class, Patrick. Uh, Jackson Howard, Deuce Robinson, Mac Markway. Notre Dame's in a strong position with all three of those guys. I wouldn't rule out a impactful in the role he's given season for Takis. I mean, I don't know what that's going to look like if that's 300 snaps or 180 snaps or, or whatever. I don't think we'll see Notre Dame run half its plays in multi-tight end sets again. And even if that's the case, I would imagine that the – usage of like 13 personnel plays is, is down a little bit where sure. Brock Wright, the third tight end played a 300, I think 300 something snaps last year. Uh, I would have to get the crack staff on that. I thought you were about uh, to say 300 pounds. I was like, well, I know yeah. he's big, but not that big. No, no, no. Yeah, well, Brock Wright was basically an extra offensive lineman out there. So, you know, I don't think, I mean, Bauman's a pretty big dude. Uh, I think he could be, I think he's more of a Brock Wright than he is a Tommy Trimble. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think Kevin Bauman, he's, he's a, again, he looks really big in these clips we've seen from, from spring ball. All right. What's the crack staff staying? I, I, I see the crack staff. <laughs> yes. The, the, the crack right. staff, you know, they just, they just work tirelessly. They've already gotten back to me. Brock, right. 345 snaps last year as uh, the third tight end tremble 472. Uh, Michael Mayer, the leader of that group with 564. So that's, I mean, I'm just trying to do quick math here. 1,300 plus tight end snaps. That seems like if you made me take the over or under on that, I'm taking the under. And if you give me the over or the under on 400 snaps for Takis, I might take slightly under. But that doesn't mean I don't think he can be impactful. We, just from the way we've heard Brian Kelly talk about him from the very limited samples that you saw of him last year, basically as the fourth tight end blocking guys and catching, you know, a couple of passes. And his his spring game sampling, yeah, I, I I think that he'll end up being like Notre Dame will have two good tight ends who help them as net positives as as run blockers and pass catchers. Yeah, correct. Staff can also confirm Brock Wright two hundred fifty five pounds, not three hundred. Yes, not three hundred <laughs> pounds. No, no, this isn't. A, what was that guy's name from West Virginia? 
or Trayvon Wesco. Yeah, this this isn't you know that kind of three hundred pound tight end who he was a draft pick by the way. That dude could move. Was he for being two hundred and ninety pounds? This is like a, a reference for only the like niche dorkiest college football fans out there. I hope somebody gets this, but shouts to you if you do. But yeah, I think he's still on the Jets. Yeah, this guy is like two hundred and ninety pounds, moves like a you know dancing bear. If I might borrow the Aaron Banks nickname terms, but yeah, no, I, that Brock Wright's not that big. <laughs> All right, before we go down that tangent, why don't we why don't we kind of transition this overall to we talk about tight end thinking, all right, pretty good spot. We don't really worry about that as far as what this recruiting class looks like. Offensive recruiting in general. I look at it and think, all right, there's still a lot of ways this can go. Receiver, I mean, there's one player committed, and again, three, maybe four in there. That can go a lot of different ways where, all right, this class is really good at receiver or, all right, it ends up being not as star power heavy, I guess, sure. as you might have imagined it to be earlier this spring or, or even right now, I suppose. Uh, offensive line, I mean, still some dominoes to fall there, but you feel pretty good about the floor. Running back, same thing. I, I think that range of outcomes as far as how we view this at the end is pretty open. The only ones that I think, all right, we have a pretty good idea of what they're going to be and how we feel about that are quarterback and, and tight end. So but I'll open the floor to you here. How are you feeling about offensive recruiting as, as someone who kind of has a better pulse on the idea of where it could go uh, than, than I would? So, so yes, so quarterback and tight end, you, you, you feel really good about that. Ian Jelly's committed. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they take some second scholarship quarterback. I can't rule out anything with, with Notre Dame recruiting. Um, but uh, of course that's in reference to Ron Paulus signing really out of nowhere. I thought he was going to be a preferred walk on. And you know, then he came in on scholarship uh, tight end again, rare and feel really good about stays landing in the class offensive line. I still don't, I, I don't really have any concerns there. Um, you have Joey to and Tai Chan, a couple of, Rivals 250 guys right around the 200 range nationally committed. They're really solid players. Still think Billy Shrouth, the uh, I think he's nation's number two guard from uh, from the state of Wisconsin. Still fairly good about where he's at with Notre Dame. And then whether they get Joe Bronner, Carson Hensman, um, Emil Wagner, or Jake Taylor. These are all four star guys on Rivals. Like Zach Rice, who set up an official visit. More details about that at blueandgold.com. Like any combination, whether it's four or five offense linemen, I, I, I just feel pretty confident that Jeff Quinn in Notre Dame is going to go take care of business there. Running back, I feel the same way. Um, whether it's Gavin Sawchuk or uh, Dallin Hayden, Nick Singleton, all those guys officially visiting in June, if they don't land one of those three, Damari Alston. You know, like if Damari Alston is your back to join Jadarian Price, not only is he higher ranked, than Jadarian Price. He's gotten over 50 offers, like um, Jabran Payne from Ohio, a four-star guy, a Mecca Megwa from Texas. Like, like Notre Dame is going to sign a really good second running back. Or if they don't and they just take Jadarian Price, like that's a really solid class at running back class just getting Price, uh, who's one of the top backs in the country. But for me, that's all context to say receiver is still the big one. Like, especially with the news about um, some guy named Jordan Johnson, I think folks might hear about. We'll touch on Johnson um, transferring later in the show. Like, the receiver is the big one where it could go different ways. Because I know Notre Dame fans and all my interactions at blueandgold.com and our loose emoji message board, yes renamed from Rockney's Roundtable to the Loose Emoji Board, uh, which was a, a fitting in honor of our late, great senior editor. Um, or, like, I, I could see Notre Dame fans, like, if, if if the Irish end up signing a Morion Walker, a three-star from Louisiana, who's com- currently committed, um, like, Joseph Griffin, a Boston College commit who Notre Dame recently offered, and then, like, let's say Xavion Bradshaw, who most Notre Dame fans are actually really high on because he's a really fast slot receiver, dynamic player. But like for most Notre Dame fans, like the casual Notre Dame fans, they'd be like three, three stars. Like that's our receiver class. So Notre Dame needs to 
like you know at, at least in terms of appeasing the fan base like go get some highly ranked like big time coveted recruits but then at the same time Notre Dame fans are probably like well we landed a five star a couple years ago and where did that get us so Notre Dame like I don't know like Notre Dame fans you tell us how you're feeling about receivers uh in, in the recruiting room right now but I think CJ Williams they've had him up on the screen here for our YouTube audience for a couple minutes here like that's a big one um go to blueandgold.com on Wednesday morning I had an update on CJ Williams uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds of that, you know, it's our premium subscribers, but his official visit plans in June, his decision timeline has totally shifted. Um, so again, scoop there at BGI um, on our website. He, This is a big one for Notre Dame. He is a very much a Notre Dame type kid. I spent 10 minutes talking to him on Tuesday. Like he is the epitome of a Notre Dame type kid. Uh, you look at, you know, some other receivers, Tobias Merriweather, um let's let i mean let's just kind of look at the receiver board here for um our our youtube audience tobias merriweather this is a big one um he's going to take an official visit to notre dame in june number 18 receiver in the country four-star prospect number 160 overall player nationally like if notre dame can go get cj williams and tobias merriweather's two strong notre dame fits on the field and off the field um you know like look that that's it's solid compliments um to Amorian Walker who's uh you know some people think he's got like Randy Moss in his game um high, boomer bust guy and then uh, strong compliments to 2021 that recruiting class Jaden Thomas Dion Colsey and Lorenzo Styles um a, a darn good class so um I guess my point here is that like yes Notre Dame fan I know you're down on Notre Dame at the receiver position it's just like quite frankly it's not been a strong suit um I mean if Notre Dame has to go get a grad and this is what Lou said a lot you know if you listen to our podcast you know Lou would say this if Notre Dame has to go get a grad transfer this off season that's not good for the receiver room like like or, or in a in a broad look at it because like that means that your guys that you already had are not developing or you don't trust them or insert you know something here about the receiver room's not as good as it should be if you need to go get a band-aid like a, a ben skaronic for your room so yeah that i i don't think that uh you know i mean maybe bringing in a, a stud grad transfer that you can't pass up would be like a really good thing and something again that might be too good to say no to but also yeah like lou would say that's not a, a good thing for the receiver room so what are you like Patrick I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about receiver recruiting in, in that room we'll, we'll talk again we'll touch on Jordan Johnson specifically and you had a really good column um, that you wrote um, after his uh, announcement of his transfer so we'll, we'll dive into that but just kind of th your thoughts about that receiver room yeah I'll, I I think Lou is Lou is right in the sense that if this is a year where they have to go get a grad transfer that's not great and every team is going to find themselves or pretty much every team. All right. We're coming out of spring or going into this or coming off the season. And we don't want to leave the chance that this very inexperienced position that we just lost a lot from is going to you know, risk that it won't be able to, to do the job. So you grab a grand transfer for a year. That was the case at receiver last year. And in the case at corner uh, yep. for Notre Dame last year, that in and of itself, if one season is fine. Like that's just going to happen. But if it's a thing where you do you have to do it multiple years in a row or which that anything, would be. like, yeah, which that would be for a receiver, that's not great. Especially when you have like, okay, last year, that 2018 class of five guys, now four with Micah Jones not, not being there. Like that's two years in a row where you're not, or theoretically, again, I'm just like, if you did it this year again and took a grad transfer, which uh, the window's not closed, but it's late, I'll say that's not a great sign for that 2018 group that, which is not like they're sophomores right now. This was last year was their third year on campus. This year would be their fourth. That wouldn't be a good sign for a team that calls itself a developmental program like Notre Dame. If you're not able to get that out of your you know, third and, and fourth year receivers. So I, I don't think the spring game said like, Oh yeah, that's where that's going even if it didn't make you think like be all right, all gung ho about the, the receiver room. I think overall that was a, a 
plus or net positive day for, for the receivers to use a term I've used a couple of uh, times on here. But why don't we go back to offensive recruiting in general and, and kind of segue and just start about talking about offensive recruiting at, at receiver. That's the spot that I, I think has yeah, the widest range of outcomes of this receiver class could be really, really, really good, or it could be not great at a time where the receiver room, they're recruiting it now when your most recent sample of receivers was not a team strength and you know, whatever it's going to be in the fall is what it is. But yeah, like you said, if it's a three, three star situation, you don't love that mainly because, because it means they missed on several you know, got guys that they really wanted or higher ranked players. But yeah, th- that one to me is the one that could go of, all right, this is, is in good shape. Like a lot of their positions on offense or man, this didn't, go particularly well yeah I I think running back and offensive line there is a range of outcomes there but it's much narrower than receiver because you have two rivals 250 offensive linemen already committed you already have Jared and Price four-star rivals 250 running back committed it's a matter of okay is Notre Dame going to land one of Gavin Sajak uh Nicholas Singleton or Dallin Hayden and have what's probably what a top three running back class in the country you would imagine yeah. When it's all said and done in, in February or, okay, they're going to miss on that, which would be fair to be disappointed about. These are guys that put time in for a while, but still land someone perhaps like a Damari Alston or some other names you've mentioned there. So that drops the ceiling to what top five, six, seven, still pretty good. Sure. Same with offensive line. Okay. Like let's say they're not able to land Billy Shrouth or Joe Brunner or Carson Hinsman and whatever you're pairing whoever the other targets would be for them with Ty Chan and Joey Tanona to again, top 250 players. You can only go so low in that regard, but yes, it would be fair to be disappointed if it didn't work out with a class because Billy Schroth and Carson Hinsman, Joe Brunner, Jake Taylor, all have been targets for a while. But again, if you're able to land those guys, you're looking at another class with multiple top 100 players that again, you probably stack up there with just about anybody is among the best classes in the country certainly would be among the best five offensive line classes out there. So that that's that's kind of where I see it. I think overall the offensive recruiting floor is fairly high, yeah. but yeah, uh, some room for it to potentially find itself capped at a little bit lower of a, a ceiling if some things don't all go to the best case scenario at some of the uh, positions that are still not really complete yet. So we're talking about talent from a ranking standpoint because that's just the easiest, right? But someone like Nicholas Anderson, this one is fascinating. You see that rivals ranking for YouTube audience, that 5.5, that is the low three star. He's got 24, 25 offers, Florida State, um, you know, uh, Arkansas, Colorado, Michigan, Miami, Penn State, Stanford, TCU, Texas, USC, all these schools, but he's ranked as a low three star. So like I can play devil's advocate on, he's actually ranked as like the number one receiver in the country on ESPN, or he's like top three or four, number 60 ish player nationally. So I, I, I can't remember if I've ever seen quite a disparity in like between two sites on a ranking, like low three star to top hunter talent. So like Nicholas Anderson, I think would be a really, good get but if he stays a three 5.53 star like if you just looked at that you'd be like what the heck you know but there's context uh joseph griffin the boston college commit notre dame recently offered him um he's going to be at our new jersey rivals camp next weekend i will see him and i'm sure we'll talk about him in, in our upcoming podcast afterwards he has had a very good spring junior season. You turn on his tape, you know, he's been really impressive. So he's a 5.6 mid three star, but you know, like he's a really good player too. Um, a couple of other receiver targets I want to talk about Taylor Groves. You know, he's not a CJ Williams and Tobias Merriweather big name, but a four star recruit, high interest in Notre Dame, official, excuse me, unofficially visiting this weekend for a self guided tour. Um, someone to keep an eye on. Andre Green is a four-star, uh, f- over 50 offers, number 30 receiver in the country. I feel like you know he is a guy whose you know his stock is high. Notre Dame would really like him. So, 
ton of different names out there. I just want Notre Dame fans to know, like, if C.J. Williams or Tobias Merriweather don't work out, and let's say it's Joseph Griffin, Nicholas Anderson, and Amorion Walker, like, that would be a really tall receiver class. I mean, um, Walker's like 6'3", 6'4", so is Nicholas Anderson, and so is Griffin. So that'd be, like, you might want an Xavion Bradshaw in there, who I mentioned earlier is like a, a slot speedy guy. Um, but Notre Dame could take four, um, and I'll touch on that in a re- recruiting mailbag I will have up on blueandgold.com this week because receiver recruiting, look, we talked about this in our last pod like a champion. It's it's just a hot topic right now um, for, for Notre Dame. So we'll, we'll continue to talk about it and keep you guys locked in right here at Blue and Gold. Why don't we wrap that up and transition into our special guest, John Mahoney, former Notre Dame walk-on. And close friend of Eli Reardon and his family both went to the same high school. We are going to play that next. First, a word from our sponsor support for Pod Like a Champion. It's brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. Manscaped is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. We have an exclusive offer for our listeners, 20% off and free shipping with the code 20BlueGold at manscaped.com. That's 20BlueGold, all one word, no spaces. Patrick, so we got, uh, you know, Manscaped reach out to us about, you know, potentially, you know, having them as a sponsor. And I was kind of like, really? <laughs> like Manscaped? I'd seen all the ads and stuff. I wasn't 100% sure, like, if I was sold on it until I got like the, the little care package they had sent us um, for YouTube audience. You know, we're going to show this for your podcast. You know, you'll, you'll just have to trust me. Um, go to the Manscaped website. So this cool little satchel bag type deal. I don't think satchel is the right word, but, um, you know, like, look, let's just get this out there. It, it's kind of weird to be talking about like, yes, I'm talking about a, you know, a, a below the waist. Like, yes, like let's not be – you know, middle school boys here. We're, we're we're talking about shaving the family jewels and, and all that stuff. Like, let's just let's just call it what it is. Um, this is the lawnmower 3.0. I was really impressed with this product um, up on the screen. Now, this is this is. I took this picture that says "Your balls will thank you." Um, got a good laugh, but like their branding is, I I love it. So, and that white bag was like all of the. Um, you know, the different um, guards and whatnot for um, the lawnmower 3.0, which like this is like a real good quality product um, that you feel in your hand. Underwear was great. The boxer brief. There's the lawnmower 3.0. Um, ball toner and ball deodorant. Like some of these things I would have just never have thought of as like, like as pro- like products that I would want in my life. Until you try it, and it's amazing. Um, my wife didn't mind either; like, you know, she's kind of liking it. So that's what really matters at the end of the day, Patrick. So uh, use that promo code twenty blue gold twenty percent off these Manscaped products and free shipping. And now we are joined by John Mahoney, a former Notre Dame walk-on safety who just wrapped up his Notre Dame career. I wanted to pop up on the screen here for our YouTube audience. This is like my favorite thing of all time, I think. This tweet. <laughs> it says, post a pic of uh, you next to someone who is slightly more famous than you, and it's John Mahoney with Devonta Smith after the uh, the semifinal game. Um, what was that conversation like, John? What, what did you and Devonta have to say? I'm sure you guys spent about 45 minutes talking, right? Yeah, it was admittedly brief, but, uh, you know, it's obviously the game had finished and you kind of go out to exchange pleasantries in the middle of the field. And, you know, after uh, after that game, I was pretty sure he was going to win the Heisman. And I just kind of came across him and I said, well, you know, it's probably in my best interest to at least go shake his hand. I mean, it's got to be a cool moment to be able to tell my kids about or something. And I had no idea that it was actually going to get, you know, captured by the camera and, you know, broadcast across the country because I got back to the locker room and, you know, everybody I knew had, you know, taken a picture of the screen and texted me. So it was kind of a kind of a funny quirk there, but. That's awesome. Yeah, so let's talk about your career at Notre Dame. So 2017, I believe, was your freshman season. Yeah, that was so my freshman year. Four years um, at Notre Dame. What are some of your favorite moments, lasting memories? Um, I mean, you, you, your, your you know, final season just wrapped up a few months ago. So right. uh, it's still fresh in your mind. So tell us about, you know, so, some of those memories. 
So the obvious answer there would be the uh, the win over Clemson this year, um, just with everything that, you know, not only our team, but you know, the student body as a whole had kind of gone through that year to to give people such a cause for celebration and, you know, to kind of forget about all that was going on in the world just, you know, for a night and kind of bring the magic of Notre Dame back was, it was something I'll never really forget. So John, you're the president of the Notre Dame walk-on players union, of course, that's right. Wapu nation. And that really seems like a, that kind of a thing that's a, a sense of pride, uh, maybe at least relative to to other programs of what Wapu Nation is and what it what it stands for. But as president overall, what do those duties entail, and you know what do people need to know about you know Wapu Nation besides that you know kind of stigma of like this is a thing that's really a you know uh, that people take pride in that are members of it. So what I really think makes us unique is, you know, and I, I don't want to call it a retention rate, but, you know, the number of guys that come in and actually complete four years as walk-ons. You know, I think if you look across the country at, you know, different schools, they've got their schools with, with tremendous walk-on traditions. There's, there's no question, but um, you, know, you see, a, they'll bring in a, a whole bunch of guys and then, you know, maybe a few will stick it out to the end. And, you know, of course, some will have great success. There are Baker Mayfields and you know, guys like that who have had great careers as walk-ons, but they're, I wouldn't, my sense of it is there isn't the camaraderie among, you know, the walk-on group like we have here. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think, you know, a school like Notre Dame and, you know, the culture that we have as, as the team kind of keeps guys around in a way that, you know, maybe it might not happen at other places. And, uh, you know, I just think that we've got a, we've got a strong structure kind of within our group and we do a good job of kind of supporting and, you know, assisting guys as they navigate the process, whether that be academically, whether that be through athletics, um, you know, it's certainly been a, a huge benefit to me as, you know, I've made my way through, um, you know, four years of, of college football. And, you know, it was, it was very rewarding this year to kind of have the chance to, you know, be that, be that mentor, be that, you know, I don't want to say father figure, but, um, you know, be a resource for some of those younger guys. So what's walk on life at, you know, at Notre Dame like? I mean, obviously the, the time commitment is the same as it would be for, for anybody else. And the reward, I'm sure, is, you know, the same, whether it's, first guy or 85th guy or what have you, but they just kind of take us in the, you know, a snapshot of, of what that life is like. You know, I think there's a perception at least, you know, nationally that, you know, walk-ons are treated poorly and um, you know, they're kind of the afterthought of the team. And I, that's never been my experience in Notre Dame. Uh, you know, obviously just based on, you know, we, we weren't as heavily, heavily recruited. We aren't, you know, generally as talented as the guys that get brought on a scholarship. So our window to play is, is probably more limited, I would say, but that, that we still, receive a ton of respect from the coaching staff and are treated, you know, by the other players on the team as you know, kind of integral components of what the team is doing. You know, obviously it, it requires a bit of an attitude adjustment just, you know, when you arrive, because, you know, even though we weren't four or five star guys, we were good players where we came from and, and you come in and you realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different, you know, you're, you're not as fast as you thought you were. You're not as big as you thought you were. You're not as strong as you thought you were. So um, it's kind of, it's incumbent on you a little bit to, um, find other ways to contribute, whether that's playing scout team, whether that's, you know, being a, being an asset in your meeting room, whether it's doing the signals, uh, you know, but I think that, you know, every great team uh, is, you know, it, it requires, it requires contributions from everybody. And, you know, I think that's, that's a role that we've really embraced. Uh, and I think you can ask, you know, the coaching staff or other players. And I think they would, they would, they would agree with me. Tell me about like a normal day at practice. Like what, what, what was that like? You know, you're working out with the safeties. I mean, you, I mean, as you said, you're probably treated just like, you know, Kyle Hamilton, right? I mean, right. Like, no, absolutely. Was... I mean, so obviously our, our role is generally more on the scout team, you know, I would say by and large, you know, there, there are occasions where guys get, you know, get called up to the, you know, to the ones or twos, um, you know, Matt Salerno got some run this year. Obviously Michael Vincent is the starting long snapper. Chris Fink had a tremendous career. So obviously he, you know, kind of transcended the, you know, the walk on life a little bit, but uh, you know, so you'll start, you'll start practice, you'll do individual drills, you know, with your position group, but then kind of, you know, particularly as the season goes on, uh, you're spending most of your time, you know, with the scout, you know, so I, I mean, I would have been with the scout defense, you know, so, you know, running the opposing team's defense against the, you know, the starting offense. So, you know, it's actually fun. Cause if you're, if you're really into football, you get the chance to experience a lot of different things. You know, you get to run, you know, you get to run Clemson's defense for, for a week. You get to run Louisville's defense for a week. Um, you know, obviously, so I was, uh, it's kind of a funny story, but Louisville runs kind of an interesting defense and uh, it's kind of a three, four. And I was actually playing down as a linebacker and felt like, you know, between a quarter and a third of the snaps, I actually had to line up with my hand on the ground, you know, on the line. And so the first time I did it, it was, 
uh, Liam Eikenberg and Brock right across from me. And they just, they saw me with my hand on the ground. They just started laughing at me. <laughs> um, and then they proceeded to, you know, blow me off the ball and, and throw me up, throw me on my butt. So uh, that, that might, might not have been my favorite week of, uh, of scout defense, but you do get the chance to experience a lot of different things. And, you have some fun stories to tell. You mentioned Salerno and in these, I don't know if you've like been keeping up with spring ball and everything, but Notre Dame's been sending out to the media, like three minutes of clips from spring mm-hmm. practice. And Salerno is just like a baller. And like, oh, he's, he's putting good. some of the stuff out on yeah. Twitter. So last year he was just the punt return guy, or, or the, I should right. even say the fair catch guy. I mean, Salerno, I've said on several of our YouTube videos, like, if there's a walk-on who's going to be put on scholarship, it's him. Especially, you know, Jordan Johnson transfers. Like, there's, if there's a receiver scholarship opening for the season, like, tell me about Salerno. No, I mean, you won't find a bigger Matt Salerno advocate than me, except maybe, you know, his parents or his brothers. But, uh, or me. You know, it's me. from the – yeah, or, or Mike, I suppose you. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, from the day he came in, he, he's a really unassuming guy. You know, not a, not a huge guy, pretty quiet, you know, kind of keeps himself – um, you know, so it's hard to, you know, when he first came in, it's kind of hard to know, you know, what's this guy all about? What's, you know, what's his, what's his MO? You start seeing him do one-on-one drills. I mean, he's, he's extremely talented, you know, has great hands, runs great routes, um, you know, faster than I think most people would kind of assume, you know, and so there isn't a whole lot that could be asked of him that he's not going to be able to do. Um, so obviously we're all pulling for him. And, you know, I think when given the opportunity, he's going to, he's going to excel. He has at every level and I don't see why that would change. Now, Notre Dame just landed a new commitment on Sunday from Eli Raridan. So interesting little story uh, and, and nugget for folks. Um, so I was in South Bend um, whenever that was, April 24th, 25th, that weekend for uh, Lou Samoji's funeral. Um, and uh, Eli Raridan was, uh, again, 2022 tight end target for Notre Dame. He was on campus for a self-guided tour. So... <laughs> Uh, this is a recruiting dead period. So, you know, I walked around campus that weekend. Me walking around campus is the same as Eli, right? I mean, that's right. all you can do. You can't go meet with Brian Kelly and Dell Alexander, John McNulty, those guys. Um, so we had Eli come by our office and John Mahoney also came by the office. So we got to see John, Eli, uh, Scott Raird and Jr. So, uh, it was, it was John, it was great meeting you. So you went to Valley high school in Iowa, of course. I did. Yep. Yep. That's where Eli Raridan currently goes to high school. So what's the connection like with Eli? What, what do you think about this pickup for Notre Dame? So our families go go way back. I would say the Raridans are some of our closest family friends. So, uh, you know, Scott Raridan Sr. is Eli's grandpa and was uh, the head strength coach on the 88 National Championship team. Um, and so his dad and so Scott and then my dad are from the same hometown. Uh, and so obviously then um, – we, we live in Des Moines now and have, you know, grown up, have, have established a very close relationship with their family. You know, I've known Eli since he was four or five years old, and it's been really fun to kind of have the chance to watch him grow up and, and blossom into this unbelievable athlete. I, mean, I think he's a, you know, I don't, I don't want to say a diamond in the rough because I, his stock is, is rising rapidly, but this is a, uh, you know, I think this, he, he gives Irish fans a lot to be excited about. Um, you know, if, if you got a few extra moments, I would just go watch his basketball highlights. Um, I mean, runs four like a guard, you know, can dunk, from you know with both hands from just about wherever he wants you know, incredibly great feet good you know very athletic good hands and it's not hard to see how that could translate to the football field you know he's got an unbelievable frame 6'6 230 I really think this guy's a limit for him so uh it's like I said he's, he's a really close friend of my little brothers um and you know, I'm just ecstatic that he uh decided to take his talents to South Bend so John will ask you for a, a little uh, I guess you could call it scouting report on the current team and and just from your four years of it, it's been a while since anyone in the media or myself uh, would, has been able to watch practice. We just get those three minute videos to psychoanalyze and they tell you 1% of what's actually happening. But tell us about some younger guys or, or guys who you know, maybe not, wouldn't be featured in those videos who you don't think are talked about enough or who you can see kind of having a, an increased opportunity and really doing something with it. Sure. So obviously I haven't been involved in spring practice. I was, I was um, done after the Rose bowl, but uh, you know, the defensive side of the ball, I think we can really, there's a lot to be excited about with Houston Griffith and DJ Brown. You know, those are guys that I was in the safety room with and I was always extremely impressed by their, you know, their knowledge of the game. I mean, their, their physical talent is, is obvious, but you know, there were guys who were very committed to the film room, you know, it's kind of be, they're becoming students of the game. And I think, you know, both of them are going to have to take on an increased role this fall, just with, you know, where we're at kind of as far as depth in the defensive backfield. So it'll be a lot of fun to kind of see what they can do. Um, I'm not horribly familiar with Coach Freeman's new scheme. 
but everything I've talked, you know, I've talked to a lot of guys and the guys seem to love him. So it sounds like they're playing free, playing fast. You know, a guy like Maris Leofau, I think will be able to thrive in a scheme like that. Um, you know, it sounds like Bo Bowers had a great spring. Um, I think the, uh, it sounds like the D line's been, been playing well too. So uh, I think there's a lot to be excited about on the defensive side of the ball. So. Hey John, I want to sneak in one more question before we let you go. Absolutely. So your safeties coach was Terry Joseph. Um, for these past couple years. And Chris O'Leary is the new safeties coach. Now, I believe he was working with the Rovers. Did you get to deal with Coach O'Leary at all? Like, what what do you kind of think about, um, you know, the Irish's new safeties coach? Do you, do you have Oh, a- absolutely. So he was the GA for the safeties for, I want to say, two years. So and when Joseph came in, Coach O'Leary was the was a safety GA for two years. And I think that was a home run hire. You know, he's a guy that brings, you know, brings a ton of energy and brings a ton of expertise, too. He's been kind of, he's been across the country. I want to say Georgia State, Georgia State, Florida Tech, maybe. Yep. So, you know, Artie has experience running his own position room, um, is young, can kind of relate to the guys, brings the enthusiasm that you need. Um, you know, I think he'll be a, a great component to the new staff. And everybody I've talked to seems to really think that, uh, you know, he's kind of taken this role and, and made it his own. So uh, should be a lot of fun to see what, what the safeties can accomplish under his under his tutelage. All right. well, good stuff, John. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, just tell us about what's next for you. Like, uh, you know, graduating from Notre Dame and, and then what does life look like for John Mahoney next? Absolutely. So um, I, I actually graduated in in January, but I'm hanging out in South Bend now, as, as I mentioned, kind of before we uh, before we went live. Uh, my, my duties as WAPU president end on Saturday. So I, I uh, at our at our formal, I'll pass the torch to the to the next generation of leadership. So that'll be fun. Um, I start my I'm going into the consulting industry, graduated with a degree in finance. So I'm going into the consulting industry. Uh, and we'll be moving up to the Twin Cities, so Minneapolis area in September to kind of start my big boy job. So, All right, John. We'll appreciate you coming yep. on, man. Appreciate it, Mike. Thank you. So great stuff there from from John Mahoney and a look into kind of a neat part of, of Notre Dame's football program. But uh, bef- before we head out, I think we should touch on the, the overall Notre Dame news uh, of the last week, and that is, of course, uh, the transfer of uh, former five-star wide receiver Jordan Johnson announced on uh, Monday, two days after the spring game, uh, that he will uh, enter the transfer portal, uh, which he is now listed in, and and seek a new home for his college career. And I don't want to say it was expected, but after you saw the spring game and as we just kind of look at this past year, I don't think it should be a thing that's completely a shock, where the spring game, uh, he was targeted once, uh, he, he did not make a catch, the play that I think is going to be one that people remember most from him in that spring game was Notre Dame wanted to throw a screen to him. I think this was about midway through the second quarter. Uh, it got the lineman releasing out there. Drew Pine looked to Johnson, and he was blocking uh, instead of looking to catch the pass. And I think that just kind of sums up the difficulty that this past year it was for him. It was – and I, I don't want to say that or, or try to make him look bad in the sense of, all right, you had a, a tough you know, freshman year. That happens. But I, I don't think it's all that surprising just given everything we've heard from Brian Kelly and just kind of seen with you know how this has gone that that's the route it went, where Notre Dame had an opening for you know, someone to step in this past fall at receiver at a position that wasn't exactly a team strength and lost a lot of production from 2019. He wasn't really part of that. It certainly had a, an opening this spring when Javon McKinley, Bennett, Skronik are gone from everything we heard from Brian Kelly this spring. It's been him almost like, you know, trying to wheedle something out of that senior class where it's like, I he said, I need it to be Braden Lindsay, Joe Wilkins, Lawrence Keyes uh, to really get themselves somewhere. And of course it's not including Kevin Austin, who, when he comes back, you expect to ultimately be all right in that conversation, if not the favorite to start at boundary receiver and potentially be that go-to target. So I don't think, and this is what I wrote that you can just point at any one person and say, Oh yeah, it's your fault. Like, I don't think you can say, Oh, this is completely on, on the staff. Or I don't think you can say, I don't think it's fair at least to point to it. 18, 19 year old kid and say, oh, it's it's all your fault for for not getting this. And I think that it, this isn't a thing that has to be mutually exclusive. I, I think if you're the staff, this should be a situation where, yeah, you know, you a little introspection of, you know, what could we have done? Is it in our jobs to help guys, you know, acclimate, whatever. But 
the one thing I do think is pretty clear is Jordan required a lot more development and adjustment and perhaps wasn't ready to make the freshman impact that that ranking uh, would have suggested. That's why I say like rankings are a data point. Like they're not everything. Like I'm not trying to say that Jordan Johnson wasn't deserving of a five-star ranking, but like you, you just got to, <laughs> you can't take those as the, the, the be all end all. Um, you know, Lou Samoji spoke about Jordan Johnson last, and it was November 24th. We were doing a live show, the, the three of us. Um, and John and Lou spoke about like, like we, we were kind of past the subject of Jordan Johnson. And I remember like Lou came back in and was like, I want to talk about Jordan Johnson. So I'm going to like, so again, this was November 24th, um, Lou Samoji talking about Jordan Johnson. So let's just go ahead and play it. And you guys can hear what Lou Samoji had to say about, uh, Johnson back then. Just going back to the Jordan Johnson, one thing here, if you get the trust and you're good enough, you're going to be playing. There's no conspiracy theory. M Michael Mayer is having an unbelievable year as a freshman there. Clarence Lewis is playing. Everyone expected Chris Tyree to play, and he's playing. If you earn the trust, and, and this goes beyond just what you do on the football, you're going to play. I mean, Kavari Russell, my gosh, for that 2012 team that went unbeaten, with, with, he came in as a running back and as a slot. It's like, okay, we need a corner. Who do we get? Who's the best guy? They put Kavari Russell there, and he makes freshman All-America. <laughs> you know, uh, Aaron Lynch makes freshman All-America the year be prior to that. Alizé Mack plays as a tight end and makes some huge catches. Uh, people are out there uh, if you're ready to play. <laughs> I just... I don't get it. Notre Dame is number two in the country for a reason. People talk about, well, I see these freshmen all over there. Well, where are they ranked? <laughs> this is part of making a great program is your seniors, your upperclassmen are developed to the point where playing freshmen is a luxury, not a necessity. And you have to really, really earn it. And guys like Mayer and Tyree and Lewis, they earn it. <laughs> so the, the the biggest thing that stands out, Patrick, is the there's no conspiracy. <laughs> like if like this is like all of the different data that comes out about Notre Dame re freshman receivers and everything. Well, one, like if you're relying on a freshman receiver, like there's something wrong with the program. Like like Bama, those freshman receivers are just too good to keep off the field, right? And Clemson, like. Johnson Johnson was not too good to keep off the field or he's struggling in the classroom like all these things like I just tend to lean towards the Notre Dame staff on something where I'm not in those meeting rooms I'm not reading the transcripts I'm not on the practice field um I will trust them in like over you know guy with 41 Twitter followers like I just will um, I don't know if that's me being naive. Um, it's definitely not me saying these coaches are infallible and they don't make mistakes. I'm sure that there are things that they would have done differently, you know, if they could have done things over again. Like we look at the Will Shipley recruitment, you know, got to mention him on Pod Like a Champion. Like I think in what you've seen Lance Taylor do in this 2022 recruiting class of running back, he's learned from that. Like, so these coaches aren't perfect. They learn from things. Um, but still at the end of the day, like, I don't think there was some conspiracy, like Lou said, like some, I've read some people say that like Brian Kelly was out to get Jordan Johnson from, from the start. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this was their prized receiver recruit in the 2020 class. Like Johnson visited Notre Dame's campus, didn't love it. And this was Chip Long mostly at the time that, that helped land, um, Jordan Johnson. But like Jordan Johnson's first visit did not go well. Like he was under the weather, the weather stunk. Like, you just didn't have a great time. They worked their butts off to get him back in the fold. But I don't know. Like, I, I wish Jordan Johnson the best. He's got, like, a dozen schools have already reached out to him. Um, I, I think he's probably going to land close to home, maybe, at like, in Missouri. Um, but, so, like, best of luck to him. But, like, I don't think this is a, you know, we need to burn down the message boards and Twitter over Jordan Johnson transferring. Like, the people I've spoken to – um in south bend are, are just not surprised by this news yeah and I, I think what this made clear was okay maybe this was a bit of a our, our rankings miss where 
is certainly again you the five star has an implication of good enough to get out there right away or give you a baseline thing and that wasn't necessarily uh, the case there but again i don't think that again, you can point at any one person and just throw all the blame on them and it, yeah when you compare freshman receiver mileage at notre dame to other places no it's not the same that's not to say that any of those other teams like in alabama or lsu or clemson or whatever are like reliant on freshman receivers if you go look back at all those you know three or those best whatever you consider to be the best offenses of the you know last three or four years certainly alabama and lsu would be two of the ones that come to mind their best receivers weren't freshmen but yeah uh, overall and there was more development acclimation time uh that jordan needed than what the ranking would have suggested and yeah i think this is just a thing that that didn't quite work out and that's sometimes that's all it is i'm just yeah. not gonna die on the hill of jordan johnson like or, or freshman receivers playing like so i see some people like the, that this is their thing like they're going to um you know everything they're going to talk about is jordan johnson and receivers like Yes, Notre Dame needs to have better receivers to win a national championship. Like they need better play there, they need better coaching, better recruiting, no doubt. But like, that's just not the hill I'm gonna die on. <laughs> like that, you know, that Jordan Johnson was was the answer for the 2020 football team or even the 2021 football team. Um, because again, I'll, I'll I'll side with like if that's like Brian Kelly, you know, is is a darn good coach. Uh, like I, I would tend to think that he's going to make the right decision more often than not so and i'm not saying anyone else has to think that way as i do but you know I, i'm not gonna act like i know better than him right so um even though i might disagree with him sometimes yeah i i think it's also a good example and i'll end on this with you yes stars matter to agree because when you look at who's signing the top classes overall, oh, don't don't just don't good. even say star <laughs> Can't no, but hang, hang, hang on, hang on. I'm you're I'm I'm getting to a point where I think you're gonna. All right, but I'll let you get there. That, like yes, that part of it is absolutely true. Where you look at who signs the best classes and and what they're doing as teams that are winning the national titles. Yeah, I get it. Like that is all true. But on a very micro level, it doesn't guarantee you anything when you look at a specific player. Like there are five star recruits who go to all of those places, like in Alabama or Ohio State or uh, what have you, and don't pan out. It's just not noticeable because there are others who step right in or, or give him something. With Notre Dame and with Jordan Johnson, it's just kind of like the perfect storm to set up an overreaction to it, or not even overreaction, maybe isn't the right word, but just more eyes on that one person because they're not, you know, loading up on on the five stars. And in this specific year, it's happening when receiver again not a team strength so it just kind of really set up this thing where there's this giant magnifying glass on okay this is a five-star recruit there's high expectations and it happened to be a a one that didn't work out in Notre Dame where again that context just doesn't happen at some of these other places because there's distractions uh, I guess of similar similarly ranked players uh, that kind of take the the onus off it so yeah, I think that doesn't help, and, and I'm sure, you know, he's, Jordan's, a, again, a teenager who, I'm sure he hears that kind of stuff, and, and like, or understands, like, the, what kind of discussion is out there about him last fall of, you know, get him on the field, blah, 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 or high expectations for him because he's a five-star Notre Dame and, and whatnot, but, yeah, I, I think it's a, a good reminder that on an individual level, doesn't lock you into yeah. the ranking doesn't lock you into anything yeah as we were talking i just was to keep thinking about the, the star rankings i, I just I, I can't do it this show i can't do it All right. we're already we too long we into we this won't do it. so we won't do it. let's move on to the so, game yeah so, yeah just sign, sign us off you know I, I i think we're i think we've i think we're good here pat all right, I, I agree. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Pod Like a Champion. Again, follow us on Twitter. Follow Mike at Rivals underscore Singer. Follow me at Patrick Engel underscore. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast or Spotify. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the thumbs up button. Leave us a rating. Leave us a review. If you do any of those, we'll owe you forever. We will talk to you again 
probably next week, uh, I would imagine. Uh, so until then, take care.